William Hopefully, your favorite videographer from Two Hats Publishing. I welcome you to another Two Hats special of community events. Let's look in and see what's really happening. Landis and that nasty woman, Patty Fink, is late, as so usual. She is, uh, she's very late. She was late last year, uh, last week, and now she's late, uh, even later this week. <laughs> so now it's the late, nasty Patty Fink. That's exactly who it is. Uh, and, and all of my nasty woman jokes, she's not here this week. I, we'll have to hold them till next oh, week. Oh, I think we'll still hear about nasty women in the coming week, so you can get on the next week. Uh, our guest today is that nasty woman from AIDS Arms, <laughs> their CEO, John Carlo. Welcome, John. Great to be here. Sorry, I just can't handle that word, nasty woman, that just I'm having trouble getting past that. But it's great to be back on the show. And we're not going to talk politics this week. <laughs> we'll try not to. <laughs> because the debates are over. Good. Can you stand watching them? No. I went to the fair that night, so, yeah. Mm. No. no. Um, but we're not talking politics. We're going to talk really nasty, disgusting diseases. Yes. We're going to talk about John's favorite um, uh, sexually transmitted diseases, uh, it's all, all kinds of stuff that's hard to get rid of, things that we don't know how to get rid of. Where should we start? Well, it is AIDS arms, so let's, let's talk a little bit about um, PrEP and AIDS and upcoming treatments and some stuff like that. Um, in the news this week, and let's just start with this one. In the news this week, there was uh, a story about somebody who contracted HIV, even though the levels, he, he was on PrEP, and the levels of drug in his bloodstream was appropriate that should have protected him. So what happened? Well, so we are hearing a second case, and this would be the second one that's been reported, and this one was at, at a scientific meeting this week, uh, of a, a gentleman in his 20s that, uh, by report, had good adherence to PrEP. In other words, he was taking it every day as, as prescribed, uh, and he still uh, got an HIV infection. Um, now, what this tells us is really nothing that would be unexpected, because what we're hearing is the infection that he received was, in fact, resistant to the medications that are a part of PrEP. So uh, we do know that there is a, a likelihood that if, if you are in contact with a virus that is resistant to the drugs that are a part of PrEP, yes, you could get an infection. And, and so we always talk about PrEP is really not foolproof. I mean, there, there certainly are going to be risks and circumstances uh, that it is not going to work. And it has still been recommended that you use protection while on PrEP. Absolutely. You know, that, that's that's an important thing, that that, that PrEP is more than just the medications. And, and really, the, a couple of things that we need to be, you know, honest about is that, at first, it should not take the place of condom use. Uh, it should be a tool in the, in, in the toolbox, so to speak, in terms of prevention. And the way I would talk about it is it's an additional measure that people can take in order to prevent getting HIV. And one of the things we did, we just jumped right in and started talking about PrEP. Give us, for anybody who doesn't know what it is who's listening, what is PrEP? Right, so PrEP stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis, and basically what it is is you are taking <coughs> two drugs that are known to be applied for treatment of HIV, but you're using those drugs as prevention. And you're taking those drugs, those two drugs that are made up of the, the single drug called Truvada, uh, you're taking that every day. Uh, and studies have shown that when you do take it every day, you really do have a good chance, close to 100%, as we know, it's not 100% exactly, but very close to 100% of preventing an HIV infection. Do we know how many people, it, it's been been out for about two years now, two, three years? Right. It has been since about 2012, so, okay, we're so it's been a little four while. Four years, yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, how many people are on PrEP now? Do we know? You know, uh, 
I, I don't know off the top of my head, but we have seen a, particularly in the last year, a significant growth. Um, I think it's close to about a million in the United States. But oh, really? uh, so we have seen an increase in the number. But the other thing that the CDC has talked about is there's still a, a significant number of people, about 1.2 million, that are in the United States that are at high risk for HIV that should be on it that are not yet on it. Um, what are the barriers to going on prep? Well, there's a couple of things. Uh, the first is cost. Uh, it is not. It's not inexpensive. In fact, it's a very expensive medication. Um, and so, if you have insurance, most of the time your health insurance will cover prep, but they will make it particularly difficult for you to get that prescription. For example, My insurance makes it difficult for me to do anything. Yeah. So it wouldn't be too much different than the typical <laughs> insurance experience. However, with that being said, antibiotic for a tooth that I needed. They wouldn't cover. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so uh -huh. the long list of, of barriers that the insurance companies cover uh, make 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 prep uh, in that list of the things that could be hard. Uh, what they'll do is they'll not dispense more than thirty days in in a supply. So, in other words, you have to go and get your refill every month. Um, they also uh, demand that the doctors prescribing prep. Uh, fill out a form called a prior authorization, which basically adds another layer of bureaucracy so that the pharmacist, in order to fill the drug on the, the health plan's dollar, needs to see this form. So the doctor has to fax the form over to your pharmacy in order for that to actually go through. So it, it creates these wow. these barriers that, that make it a little more difficult to stay on PrEP um, as opposed to other, other things. So it, it can be hard, uh, but most of the time health plans will cover it. Yeah, I know, a couple of my friends are on it, and re very recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we, we hear stories that, you know, some people are on what's called a high deductible health plan, which means they don't cover things until after you've spent a certain amount out of pocket. Um, a lot of people then are seeing those first prescriptions of Truvada being up around, you know, $2,000. Every year. Uh, yeah, every year. So you have to pay that every year yeah. at the beginning of the year. So uh, it can be difficult to afford those prescriptions. Um, now, there's there are good pharmacy prescription assistance programs out there, uh, but, you know, we always say that there's no guarantee that you're going to get all of your out-of-pocket expenses covered by these coupons or copay cards and those kinds of things. Right. Um, what about any... There, there was a lot of worry about what it would do to somebody's liver, kidney, yeah, what, are, what, are what are the like side effects? What are the side effects? Right, yeah. right. So, you know, the, the good news is Truvada has been uh, in as part of our HIV treatment regimen uh, for, for quite a while. These these are, are known drugs. It's intracytabine, intracytabine is one of them, and uh, tenofovir is the other one. Uh, these drugs are, are known to be some of the safest drugs that we have in terms of treating HIV infection. Um, so we have good experience. Now, somebody living with HIV isn't exactly the same as somebody not living with HIV, but so most of our experience is around HIV positive patients, but in those those patients, these two drugs are very safe. Um, we do know that there are some side effects and risk factors, particularly around uh, bone density and kidney disease. Um, so one of the things you have to do if you're on PrEP is you have to see your doctor regularly and get blood tests to make sure that you're not having any adverse effects around the kidneys and, and the bones. Mm -hmm. um, and then those are doctor's appointments that your uh, insurance company doesn't want to cover. That's right. So, again, it goes back, you know, uh, the typical, you know, somebody on PrEP needs to be seen every three months. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, again, every three months, that means you're going to get a, an office visit. You're also going to get uh, laboratory tests. Those are typically are costs that the health plan will pick up, but you might be faced with a deductible. Or a copay, uh, or even coinsurance. So, so there there is some differences depending on which health plan you have in terms of how much you're going to have to pay to stay on prep. Fortunately, I have one of the more expensive health plans. I know. <laughs> we, we all. I mean, there's really no it, health plans have changed over the particular oh, last couple horrible. of years, and they they really have gotten harder and harder. Not not consumer friendly. Um, we should also mention in in the discussion is we recognize particularly here in Dallas, there's a significant percentage of people that have no health insurance, despite Obamacare and despite kind of these new things. And so you know, particularly for those without health insurance, there really is no place to get prep. There's a lot of groups that are working on it, including us at AIDS Arms. But right now, th there are a very limited uh, access points for people that don't have insurance in order to have prep. Uh, unless you live in Norway. <laughs> News also came out this week that Norway became the first country to give it away, giving away prep for free mm -hmm. to everybody. 
Now, it doesn't go into detail here about, you know, what what do you need? What, um, well, it would be to high met. risk. Yeah, to, to go get it. I don't know if anybody could just walk in and say, oh, I need some prep. Right. But, you know, I, I think that that... that Situation. Is that a good thing? Yeah, well, I think it is a good thing. I think that, that what it does tell us that is that everybody does their health care differently around the world. Uh, Norway is known to, to have a much more uh, population-based approach to their health care. Um, the United States is a little more individual-based. Um, and so that type of a program I don't think is, is going to necessarily work here because we have a, just a very different vision on, on how we deliver health care in this country. Um, with that being said, I'll just make a commentary. We are the leading the world in the amount of cost that we pay for in terms of health care. Uh, we also lead the world in terms of health indicators that show our health care system is not as effective in terms of uh, maternal mortality, maternal child mortality, vaccine rates, high rates of obesity, chronic disease. So, um, you know, it, it, it is interesting to see what other countries do and um, perhaps see where we have opportunities, but... Um, this, this would be something where I'd, I don't see us uh, at least leading that. Well, well not us, but for Worth. Um, Tarrant County's health department has started a prep clinic. That's right. Which I, I guess is not, again, for everybody, but for people who are considered at high risk. Do you know anything about that program? Yeah, yeah. so they, they have uh, started a, a great program there. It's out of the health department. Um, you know, health departments in Dallas and in Tarrant County uh, have – for many, many years had sexually transmitted disease clinics. Uh, we have one here in Dallas County, of course. Um, you know, so there's a great opportunity there because many people that are seen there for STDs don't have a medical provider anywhere else, are not in the healthcare system at all, but are getting STDs. So it's a perfect opportunity to have PrEP available because these are the individuals we know are going to get an HIV infection at some point in their lifetime. So um, I think it's a great opportunity to to uh, offer PrEP, particularly those that don't have insurance. It's a great access point. And, and it's also very important is to see their, their outcomes. So hopefully it will set the bar in terms of what community health is is. You know, to help build that approach, because I think it is a good idea. Does Dallas County have any plans for anything like that? Are they just watching Fort Worth? Are we planning on getting fjords? You know, um, I haven't heard anything from the health department in terms of uh, building up a prep program here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, again, everybody's a little different, and the, I tell you that Trinity River is a, is a, a great divide uh, <laughs> between uh, cultures and uh, access and everything else. So uh, just because they're doing it does not mean we're going to do it here. Um, but it is something that's uh, great that they're doing, and um, hopefully they'll, they'll provide a lot of opportunities to show um, some good outcomes. I, I want to go back to this person who contracted HIV, uh, even though he was on PrEP, uh, what you talked about was he contracted it because what he contracted was a drug-resistant form of the virus. How common is that being, and how, how afraid of it should we be? Yeah, you know, I think this is something that's still emerging. Uh, you know, we do know that there are resistant viruses out there, um, yeah. and so... What, what, first of all, it's probably good to take a step back and, and, and talk about how resistant viruses get started. Mm -hmm. So, because this goes back to our, our other thing that we should be focusing on is HIV treatment. Mm -hmm. And so, resistant viruses really come about if some, if for some reason the medications that somebody is taking is not being effective. Now, most of the time, unfortunately, it's because uh, somebody's not taking their pills every day. And in those situations, if you're not taking your pills consistently, what will happen is the virus will rebound. Uh, it will not be a suppressed virus. And so while you're having partial drugs that are not fully effective in your system, the virus will use that environment to develop its own resistance so it can continue to essentially replicate. So then what happens is that that virus that's now resistant to drugs can be transmitted to other people. Uh, it's not as common. Uh, you certainly are, are, it's more rare to see resistant viruses transmitted, but it certainly does happen. Um, and so one of the concerns is, is the more we use PrEP, the likelihood is we're going to start selecting more and more resistant viruses that are going to be transmitted. Mm -hmm. um, the concern with that also is, 
PrEP medications are also a, an important backbone of the existing HIV treatments that we have available. We've for many, many years thought about this, that we've got to be very, very cautious in terms of our HIV treatment regimens because what you don't want to have, and we do have some in our clinic, basically there there is no drugs that are available that can treat the virus that somebody has because they have exhausted all available treatment strategies. Those are very, very hard cases to manage. Mm -hmm. And so some of the concern around PrEP is we don't want to increase that likelihood factor that that's going to be um, something that we're going to contend with. Um, so the story is still out. I, I think that this, this, this tells us that we need to be more aware that this is something that's going to be a part of PrEP uh, and certainly keep that in mind when we're going forward. So we don't know. I know there's a lot of unanswered uh, questions with this particular story, but the I, th I think you're right that the, the gentleman who, the 20-year-old, has slept with two uh, men prior to learning that he was, in fact, infected. So is it safe to assume that those two men or one of them are not on drugs or not taking their drugs? Hard to say. Yeah. yeah but that's something that, that's definitely going to need to be you know, uh, determined. The other thing I think it's important to, to look at in this particular case, um, the the person's primary partner was HIV positive, was undetectable, uh, and they determined that this person did not get HIV from his primary partner. Um, there's a couple of things that I think we should highlight about that. Is first, we're reaffirming an important part about HIV prevention, and that is treatment. So without question now, you remember in 2008, the Swiss said, if you are undetectable, you're not going to transmit the HIV virus to somebody else. Right. That, that was, uh, you know, was sort of a, yeah. Revolutionary. Revolutionary. People were very, very concerned. And that actually has stood the test of time. And, in fact, some great studies have followed that statement up and said, yes, if you are virologically suppressed, the chance that you're going to transmit to another person is close to zero. So the best thing that we can talk about now in this current treatment age is that if we keep people virologically suppressed, uh, the transmission risk is zero or close to it. Um, and that's really, really great. So that's really an important tool that we do have. Um, and in this particular case, uh, proves that. Further highlights that. That's yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, at least in, in the report that we were just reading before, is that it does sound like that this, this person received the virus from, from uh, another sex partner. And they know that primary. because it's a different HIV. Yeah, so that, that's another thing that's new um, that, that, that's interesting, is we're starting to do deeper tests to look at um, the genetic relatedness between HIV viruses. And um, so what's happening now, and this is particularly spearheaded by the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, they're looking at past patterns by looking at the genetic fingerprint of the viruses. So they're trying to determine these networks, these sexual networks or transmission networks that helps explain how HIV is being transmitted in our communities. Um, so, so there's some new things that are coming up in terms of looking at you know, the disease patterns. The hope is that we could do interventions more rapidly. Um, and, and the reason we are doing this is uh, one of the things we know is when we're looking at new HIV cases, most of the time the transmission occurred in the pretty far distant past. Um, it's pretty rare that you're getting somebody that acquired an HIV infection and knew that that's what happened in the last two to three weeks. And so, so you're really doing um, to try to look at you know disease patterns and try to find cases and things like that. It, it gets very, very hard because most of the time you're, you're, you could be even years from when you were infected. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. We need to take a break. You're listening to Lambda Weekly on 89.3 KNON FM. I'm Dave Taffet here in the studio with Laron Landis, and our guest is John Carlo from AIDS Arms. We'll be back with more right after this. Hey, I'm John Carlo. You're listening to Lambda Weekly on 89.3 KNON FM. And that was from our from your last appearance, I guess. <laughs> it's a long time ago. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, We're talking to John Carlo. He is the CEO of uh, AIDS Arms, and AIDS Arms is the largest AIDS organization in Texas. Right. So we're the largest uh, sort of freestanding nonprofit that does exclusive work around HIV and HIV prevention, as opposed to those for-profit ones. Well, there there are some that are out there. Oh, okay. Oh, oh. So before the break, we were talking about the uh, the news that just came out. Um, the second, I guess, rare case of a person who has contracted HIV, though, in spite of the fact that they were on PrEP. So you, you mentioned that this person's partner was um, on PrEP and his um, viral uh, load had been suppressed. 
and it's undetectable. We hear that a lot, undetectable. Is that, um, first, if you could explain what undetectable means and why well, that's still not a cure. Right. So, and, and that's, a, that's a great point to bring up. So, um, somebody that is infected with the HIV virus, um, when you are applying the new treatments that we have today. Uh, what can happen, and happens actually thankfully most of the time, uh, is that you can eliminate the virus from circ- this freely circulating in the, in the bloodstream. So the reason we know that is we somebody that's living with HIV will have routine laboratory tests. And those tests will specifically drill down to look for copies of the virus in the blood. Okay, and we have now pretty good, sophisticated lab tests that now go down to less than twenty copies per uh, nanoliter in the blood. So, so for somebody that is undetectable, it means that the test that is run on the routine laboratory system does not find the virus. And so, a lot of times that'll show up in the lab report as less than twenty, or it also might be undetectable. And it basically means that the test that's being used to look for the virus is not finding it in that person living with HIV. So. So why is that not a cure? Well, a couple of reasons. Number one is if you stop taking medications, pretty quickly the virus will rebound. So very quickly the virus will become detectable. So where was it? So it exists in places where the the, the drugs or the treatment is not e- able to reach. Uh, so we call those areas very specific um, immune um, privileged areas that, that are perhaps hiding the cells that are infected with HIV. Um, and a lot of a lot of work is going on right now in terms of trying to find those pr- particular areas uh, and perhaps have new therapies that'll target those areas and maybe bring the virus out of those hidden sectors in order to really get to the place where we're talking about, which is a cure. And and where do they think those are? Somewhere in the blood, just not testable in the blood, or is it in the Uh, spinal column? A a couple places we we do know, and one of the prime candidates is the the immune cells that are around the gut, the GI system. Mm. So we think that there's some some places where um, the, the cells can go and hide out essentially and, and not be detected through traditional blood tests um, and uh, they, they, they do have some sophisticated tests that can go and look for those uh, but for the most part we, we believe that there are defined cell types that are keeping the virus sort of there um, and then um, you know once once you, you know you stop taking treatment it, it, those those will be the places where it cer- certain essentially springs out and then will actively replicate um, the good example that we know that this is where uh, the f- one functional cure that we're aware of, where this is a good opportunity to talk about, is the Berlin patient. Oh, so, yeah. so the Berlin patient, if you remember, is now I think four years out, not on treatment, and is still undetectable. Um, how did that happen? Well, he had a bone marrow transplant, um, and in that process, when you do a bone marrow transplant for for leukemia, I believe it was. Um, they they actually put um, sort of the stem cells that, that were transplanted were from an individual that was known to be a, a, a suppressor of the virus had a resistant uh, genetic stream uh, genetic line and and then essentially this person has now been undetectable thanks to this bone marrow transplant so it just kind of shows you that you have to dig into those those dark areas of the immune system in order to fully eradicate the virus from the body. Hmm. So what is it looking like as far as a possible vaccine? That's always a topic of conversation. Yeah, and, you know, we haven't heard any new emerging things on and this year in our scientific meetings. We didn't hear a lot of good news around this, the, the evolution of vaccines. There's certainly some ongoing trials that are, are being uh, around the world being t- uh, taking place. Um, you know, we're still, still a ways off from, from a vaccine. Um, I think we've got to start breaking down this concept of vaccine because um, we, we – we need to think about vaccines as, okay, so that's our prevention tool. Okay, but there's also a question of what are we going to do for uh, eradication treatment, in other words, a curative treatment. And, and so, the, so when we're applying the concept of vaccine, I believe we're thinking of a vaccine that would prevent an HIV infection. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's also a need to go further into the curative research so that when we have infections, we can eradicate and, and eliminate the need for ongoing treatment like we now thankfully see with hepatitis C. Um, one of the things that they're working on is long-acting uh, long injections that 
instead of taking a pill every day, you would go in for a vaccine basically once a quarter or something like that? Yeah, this is some really interesting things that are coming out. So so what we're, what we're now seeing is there are some medications that, that are effective against HIV um, that have a very, very long half-life, which means they can exist in your body for a very, very long time, and that eliminates the need to take the pills every day. In fact, we're thinking that some of these could be given as a shot uh, every two to three months uh, and effectively keep the amount of drug necessary in the body to keep the virus suppressed uh, in, in that system. Is that dangerous that you're getting a higher amount at the beginning that's wearing down, or is it a different drug? It, it, well, it's it's. There's a couple things. Uh, it's it's not necessarily a higher dose once it's being delivered. It's that the body takes a longer time to actually process out the drug. So it's not necessarily you're giving a higher dose. It's that it's it's the dose is staying sustained for a longer period of time. Why is it doing that through a vaccine and not doing it through a uh, pill? Well, I think that, that, that the delivery mechanism is important because um, when, when you are taking a pill, your, your digestive system does cut down on the amount of drug, your first pass, if you will, through the liver and, right. and all that. So um, the best way to get drug on board is always a shot. a shot. Now, we thankfully have oral medications that are effective so we can take the pill every day. The, the thinking is is if you're going to keep it on board for a two to three month period you're, you're able to tolerate a shot uh, and so that's where they're starting from mm. um, it is possible we could be at a place where we see a pill that works every two to three months as well but they're really focusing first on the injection since that's probably tolerable on on a you know, three months duration. You're less, well, not necessarily. I was going to say you're less likely to have a reaction to a shot, but that's not really true. Not necessarily. I mean, you would have some muscle sore, you know, normal vaccine type things. However, um, you, you definitely could eliminate some of the, the GI side effects mm -hmm. um, that are associated with taking the pills every day. Mm -hmm. So it is possible that you could uh, change, you know, some of the, the, the things that people experience. Mm -hmm. you, you, you mentioned um, uh, hepatitis C. That's been in the news. Last year, it looks like they, the FDA approved a pill, a one, once a day pill for um, Hep C. Um, is, is that a cure or is that a, 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 just a really good treatment? Yeah, so, so some really amazing things that have happened uh, in hepatitis C. I think we're now at two to three Nobel Prize winners for people that have sort of pioneered studies and, and scientific discovery, which has enabled um, a, a treatment regimen for hepatitis C, all the genotypes. So these, these are hepatitis C has different um, genotypes or different types uh, and so some therapies were better than others because there were just different strains of the virus. These new therapies are great against all of the types um, and are achieving functional cures which means after the red you know the the duration of treatment continued lab tests fail to show the presence of the virus um, so that would we we would describe that as a cure mm -hmm. um, and, and so some really great things have happened in in this the world of FC is it possible they'll show up again and I guess what I'm really asking is how long ago did, like, Harvoni is the brand name that everybody knows, but right. there are others. Yeah. Um, how long have any of those drugs been out there to be tested that we know, like, yeah, it's 10 years or... Yeah, you know, it, this is a very emerging uh, emerging science sure. and emerging, but, you know, what we have is, is a pretty good sense and pretty good modeling that shows uh, that if you have no detection of virus for a duration of time, the likelihood of a rebound or, or something like that is pretty small. So so there's some, some good data on modeling that can really help guide that decision making. And, and I guess the one that I'm thinking of is, you know, if you ever had chicken pox, uh, later on you can get shingles and that can be 60 years later. Yeah, you know, I mean, there, there's certainly things we, we can't say for sure. Um, you know, we definitely would not want to close the door. And I think a couple of things on, on curative treatment for hep C is, one, the long-term effects. The second thing is, yes, you, the risk of reinfection is there as well. So so you're not immune, we don't think, to, to catching hep C again. Um, but, but you're right. I, I don't think we would... Be, we'd be cautious about the long-term uh, effects and, and risks, uh, particularly around the things that hepatitis C does cause, such as liver cancer. Um, we can't say for sure that there's not going to be an increased risk lifelong uh, for somebody that's now in a curative 
position. You would think somebody would be less likely to absolutely liver cancer. And I think the the likelihood is less, and the likelihood of of uh, you know the liver going getting worse in terms of in, in, you know the the decomposition into cirrhosis and things like that would be much wor- less. Uh, but with that all being said, I think. We would want to be cautious in terms of the long term. Um, curative is definitely better. Uh, definitely better to be in that situation. But you know, we need to keep watching for a longer period of time. Is there any new news with um, treatments to H? Um, I mean, hepatitis A or B? So hepatitis A, there's not anything that has been uh, recently around Hep A. That that's you know one of the things that we we. Are that's generally referred to as a foodborne uh, virus, and really uh, is now more important around the vaccine. And actually, the vaccine works pretty well. So there's some great things that are there already. Hepatitis B is the same way. Um, I think one of the things that we are watching now with hepatitis B, we I don't know the exact year off the top of my head, but we've started with hepatitis B pretty much for all newborns. And so we should see um, some reductions pretty soon in terms of the hepatitis B incidence, um, thanks to the good vaccine campaigns that we now have in the United States. Unless you don't believe in science. Well, we do. We do have our well, anti-science <laughs> contention here. Uh, we we fight the battle. Uh, I, I, one, of, one of the other things I, I actually would mention something that came out this week uh, around the the HPV virus uh, is that that oh, uh, yeah. you know for our younger individuals who are candidates for the virus, men and women, by the way, now, uh, I can't remember the exact age, but I think it was up to 13, that only two vaccines, only two shots are necessary, not three, hmm. um, in, in order to get that, that great immunity. Uh, that helps out a lot, because that third shot was always the hardest one to give. So so really, um, good things around the vaccines. That, that vaccine, by the way, is a great vaccine. Uh, prevents, really, the cancer types of human papillomavirus that are out there. Uh, everyone should be lining That's up to get the first that one. vaccine that prevents a cancer, isn't it? Well, technically, hepatitis B would be the first, oh, okay. but but yeah, absolutely, it's certainly the most um, talked about one, and and the most diverse cancers that are prevented. Because you keep in mind, this is this is a cervical cancer prevention, uh, this is a throat cancer prevention, uh, and this is a rectal cancer prevention. So, so really, all all three of those types are pre- prevented from this vaccine. Hmm. How old do you recommend somebody get it? I, I know they're recommending, uh, like you said, newborns are yeah. getting it now. Originally, when it came out, it was for 16-year-olds. So now, now the, the Hep B is the newborns. The HPV is generally recommended. The, HPV, yeah. the, the, the key to the recommendation on that is that you should get it before you're sexually active. Now, everybody's a little different, but the, so they're really thinking... So Laurent should still get it? Uh, ah! that, theoretically, yes. In fact, you can give it up to to beyond the age of somewhere around 26. After that, we think that there's problems. But I thought there was a minimum also. You can't, like, Some, I don't know if my daughter's a candidate. Somewhere around 9, 10 is yeah. really around the right time. Okay, um, okay. That's, that's right, right at the right time. And, and why before you're sexually active? Well, so it's before you get the HPV infection. Right. Oh, okay. so, so once you have the infection, the vaccine's not going to help. Now... With that being said, if you have had these, these HPV also causes genital warts, which is one of the most common STDs. By the way, I think it's some of the somewhere around eighty to ninety percent of all Americans are going to have a genital wart in their lifetime. Um, so you want to get the vaccine before. But with that being said, even if you had a genital wart, you're still a good candidate because there's many types of the virus that that are there, and you may not have had the cancer causing one for your the one that you've had previously. So it's still a good idea to talk to your doctor about whether it's a good idea. Mm-hmm. Right. And so you're not saying, okay, once you're sexually active, that's it. You're just right. saying it should be before, but e- right. even at the beginning. That's right. Um, well, let's talk about some other sexually transmitted diseases. My favorite would be chlamydia. Yours? Well, I, I mean, ah. we, we pick you favorites. You have a favorite? <laughs> I, I don't. I, hard to pick favorites, but I, there's so many these days to, to, to talk about. You know, there was a recent report that, that came out this week that uh, the United States is, is unsurpassed last year in the amount of other STDs that have occurred in Americans uh, at an unprecedented level. Uh, I don't know if we should be proud of that um, milestone. Uh, I think we should be concerned more than anything else. Um, 
I don't I don't necessarily pick favorites in this this game, but I, I will say that uh, the concerns that I have are around uh, gonorrhea because what we're seeing now is more and more resistant gonorrhea. In other words, this this is a bacteria that is showing um, that the, the antibiotics we typically are using don't work anymore. And is so, that for the same reasons uh, for? Uh resistant HIV strains? It's similar. It's similar. Um, you know, the, 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 the challenge is there's so much antimicrobial, antibiotic used today. Uh, the thinking is that these, these bacteria are being exposed to these these antimicrobial um, uh, in, in, in a lower level or perhaps sub-therapeutic levels, and it's allowing them to emerge as resistant. Uh, well, like, you know, for an example, like when, whenever Patty gets gonorrhea, you can't get her to take her pill every day, so but you have to take a certain dosage. Right. It, if it's not being attacked with enough, right, it becomes resistant That's to right. it. That's right. Yeah. yeah there, there, there's there's many you know, and and also on top of that, if you are uh, treating perhaps a sinus infection and using similar drugs and actually have that on board, you can also offer the opportunity for resistant mm. you know bacteria. So so there's there's many reasons or iterations as to why uh, you're, we're going to see it. But the bottom line is we are seeing it, and the concern is that if we run out of drugs available, we're not going to be able to easily treat gonorrhea, um, which is an altogether unpleasant um, thought to, to think about. Um, the, the other ones that we're concerned about is syphilis. Um, syphilis has been something we think is the ancient scourge of the earth uh, eradicated by modern medicine. Well, that for the most part was true up until recently where we're seeing a rebound uh, in cases at, at high rates. Um, it became more rare, but it was never eradicated. Never went away completely, but we were pretty close to talking about syphilis elimination campaigns. Mm. Wow. Um, and so we were pretty close. Uh, but, but unfortunately... Um, and a lot of this does have to coincide with the HIV epidemic because uh, we have seen a pattern of uh, syphilis transmission in HIV positive individuals. It seems to be more transmissible uh, in those kinds of things. So we have seen it. A- Someone really- with HIV is more susceptible to it? Or, uh, or more transmis- is able to transmit it more likely, yes. Is there any reason that we know of or we don't? Well, I think that... It's because the, the immune system is already suppressed? Right. So, so with a suppressed immune system, it's likely that the syphilis is not being kept at bay as much and and we're seeing it more frequently. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, and without that immune system, you'll get a more virulent case. Yes. Quicker. Right. Yeah. There, there are, there. Are, it is. It does behave a little differently in an HIV uh, oh, patient. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Well, we need to take a break. You're listening to Lambda Weekly on 89.3 KNON FM. I'm Dave Taffet here in the studio with Laron Landis, and our guest is John Carlo from AIDS Arms. We'll be back with more right after this. I'm Joey Santos, and I listen to KNON-FM 89.3, Lambda Weekly. And this is Lambda Weekly. I'm Dave Taffet here with Lauren Landis. The late Patty Fink will be with us next week, she says, but who knows? <laughs> I, I, I believe her. I think she'll be here. Well, unless she's even later. Uh, we're talking to John Carlo. He is the CEO of AIDS Arms and... Um, how did LifeWalk do this year? You know, LifeWalk 26 was a great year. The The weather was fabulous. We had a great turnout. Our teams, we had some major milestones this year. Uh, guys and Dolls and the green team celebrating anniversaries. Uh, so it was a great day. Uh, a little hard to come off of the 25th anniversary. Mm-hmm. We certainly last year we, we had a huge outpouring of support because of that important milestone. So, you know, we knew going into this year, 26 was going to be a little harder to keep the momentum. Them. It was still a great day. We had a great turnout. Um, you know, the volunteers just did a tremendous job. It's always great to see just the amount of effort that goes into that that event, and just seeing the turnout was fabulous. Now, Life Walk 25, he's understating it a little bit, was the largest event in Texas for HIV and for local AIDS organizations. There's a real big one that goes on, um, Art for uh, AIDS and, no, uh, Houston. Two by two for art and AIDS here in Dallas. Most of that goes to AMFAR, um, but uh, which is a national organization doing research. So there are bigger fun, but going to local organizations, they beat Black Tie in the amount of money that went to local organizations. Uh, and they also beat the Houston AIDS Walk, which for years was our scourge because we couldn't beat it. Oh, wow, that's and they were awesome. Houston. Yeah, right. and, and they beat the... 
Houston A's walk. So That's I mean, awesome. that was that was great. Uh, so the fact that you're down and you're 26 a little bit, well, we, like I say, we, you know, Life Walks is a community event. We're very proud to be the stewards of the, of the of an event that has been going on for so long. It is very hard to keep. Um, the attention on something for such a long duration. It's only because we've had such great volunteers and great teams that have been able to keep that keep that alive. Um, I, I think you know, in the face of complacency with HIV in general, these 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 concepts, these, it, it really does take a lot of effort to keep the community aware and keep us in tuned to to this this, this concern. Uh, and so, so we hope to go forward and continue life walk, but it also, we are maintaining an awareness that, you know, things change. It's hard to keep things for a long time. Uh, mm-hmm. and we're looking for that next step, um, that's going to be coming up soon. Sure. Um, we were talking about some STDs. We were. And, um, before the show, I was sharing with John that I had a discussion with a friend not so long ago. Talking about um, how to talk to your your teenagers about sex and sexual activities and certain because yep, that's coming up for you. It's coming up, Ron. Um, and you know, in 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 the conversation, it, it came clear there's a lot of misconceptions about what can transmit this or what can transmit that, um, particularly with STDs and even with HIV. There's you know some misconceptions. So. Um, if you could talk a little bit about, you know, particularly like with oral sex, I think mm-hmm. there's a misconception yeah. that the HIV can't be transmitted that way, and some STDs also. So, particularly with teenagers, they will do that and not consider it sex. Yeah, you know, they're, they're, this is these are changing times. Certainly, mm-hmm. the, the the world around us has changed. Um, the 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 challenge for us is to really be honest and open about us being sexual beings. And as sexual beings, we have sexual practices that are not just uh, just the simple conservative, I guess, view of what a man and a woman do um, in, in the privacy exactly. of their home. There, there's much more diversity that, that, that is out there around us being sexual beings. Um, and I think that, that as you point out, there are risks, uh, particularly for somebody that does not believe that a certain behavior is constituting sex, mm-hmm. not just a disease risk. There's a, there's a lot of other social, psychological risks affiliated with that as well. So so the, 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 the bottom line on this, I think, is you have to be open and honest about what is the different ways to have sex? It's not just the the penal vaginal intercourse. Right. You know, we have to talk about because we've heard about you know the fact that that women and teen women don't believe that they are having sex, but they're engaging in penal anal intercourse, mm-hmm. um, and they don't constitute that as having had sex. They're still quote right. unquote a virgin. Right. Um, you know, these things happen, um, and it is part of the the new generation, if you will. Um, and you're absolutely right. Um, you know. We do see STDs not, uh, you know, exclusive to to the the genitals. So we have extra genital right. transmission, uh, <clears throat> syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia. It's certainly out there. So you know, the bottom line is to have an open and honest discussion about all the different ways we as human beings have sex. Mm-hmm. Talk about the risk factors with all in each of those. Understanding that the risk is not equal. By the way, uh, we do know that oral sex has a much less risk of HIV transmission. Um, than than other ways, but mm. but certainly it's important to keep that broad discussion because if you don't do it, the opportunity is there that that those things will will happen, uh, and you haven't had the opportunity to educate people that those are there. I always thought that was so bizarre that argument because if you're not enjoying it and it's not sex, what is it? You know, like you said, be honest about it. A- and there are other ways to get pregnant because Lauren got pregnant in one of those odd ways. I did. <laughs> well, you know, the, the other thing I think that... And she's that, seven years old. Seven years old. <laughs> but the, the thing that I think is interesting today, I, I think, thankfully, because of what's happened in the LGBT movement, that, that there's more... Um, you know, acceptance, but also probably more discovery, more openness about that. And so, so, so very, very likely, um, you're going to find more, um, you know, sexual behaviors that are more in general and in tune with us as being human beings. So boys might have sex with boys and girls, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, might be fluid in terms of that orientation for, for a period of time. And I think, experimentation. And I think it's going to be more frequent. That's not to say it wasn't, a part of the past, it just probably wasn't talked about as much. Right, um, but, absolutely. But, but that means that the, as now we are talking about it more, how are we going to sort of guide that conversation effectively? 
Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And with your um, organization, I know it seems like HIV is thought of as a very adult disease. Um, do you do you have any teenagers? Oh, unfortunately, yeah. Um, you know the 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 unfortunate part is HIV is growing in in increased numbers in younger people. We're talking wow. 17, 18, 19, up to the age of twenty four. Those are the highest rates of new infections. So so we are seeing it. We're seeing it particularly in uh, men of color. So really the the the, the challenges are we're seeing new infections in higher rates in specific communities and we're really trying to do what we can to reach those quicker because we are missing those. Mm. Um, The big new virus is Zika and we here in Dallas can be very proud that the first sexually transmitted uh, (laughs) case of Zika happened right here in our community. Uh, You know, we get all the good diseases here. We, we do really well at we, being first. We, uh, we do that well. You had Ebola. You know, we had uh-huh. Ebola. We had Zika. I, I think that, that uh, Zika is another opportunity to think about um, because I think uh, that what we need to be learning about Zika is it's another one on the list of a long list of these emerging threats that are happening. seems like it's happening more and more frequently. It is thanks to our global travel, our climate change and some of the other things that are happening in our communities that are resulting in an environmental risk, a disease transmission risk that's really not been seen before on this planet. So we have to be thinking about what can we do in prevention, not just against Zika, but against all of these threats that we're likely going to be encountering in the next, you know, next decade. Um, I, I think it's it's important to talk about this alignment or awareness that we know since Zika is sexually transmitted. We've been talking about all these other STDs. As Americans, we don't do so well in looking at STD prevention. And so is Zika now going to use that as an opportunity to, uh, you know, basically be transmitted across the U.S., not just with the mosquitoes, but also as an STD? Um, I think that's something we need to be contending with and talking about. Um, the fact that this, this virus actually causes uh, birth defects is, is very, very significant. Um, again, hitting the core, we don't necessarily do very well in maternal child child care and prenatal care. Uh, we don't, you know, we, we, we have some ongoing problems, if you will, in terms of access to care in our communities. How is Zika going to impact that? Uh, pretty substantially. So we, we, at first, everyone, you know, watching this, you thinking, you're thinking that Zika is just through a mosquito bite. So now that we know that it's sexually transmitted, is it a bloodborne disease or any bodily fluid? Yeah. So we, we think it's 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 going to be a bloodborne disease, very similar to HIV or hepatitis C. Um, probably not as as uh, from saliva or just contact to mucous membranes. We think that this is probably a bloodborne um, virus. Primarily, even though we are going to talk about it as an STD, l- let's talk about it as as a whole. So the ways you can get uh, Zika virus is first the maternal to child transmission. During pregnancy would be one method. Sexual transmission, as you talked about, would be another. Blood transfusion would be another, and there are taking precautions to prevent that. And the last one is, and probably still the most important, mosquitoes. Mm-hmm. Um, and the mosquito threat here in Dallas is is significant. Uh, they're still out there, even though it was a cool morning today. I can attest to that. Um, and it, it definitely is something we have to keep our eyes on, because in our experience, we've had our epidemics of mosquito-borne infections, and uh, it is it is possible that we could see Zika as part of our mosquito threat here in this area. Why did this one take off? And last year the big uh, threat was chikungunya. Why did that one kind of seem to disappear? It's still out there, but... You know, I, we're, we're not at a place where we can predict with certainty how these mosquito-borne threats are going to exist, how they're going to move, evolve, transmit, or go away. Um, you know, we've had West Nile here since... 2003 in the Dallas area and I can tell you as being the former health officer when we tried every year to try to predict how bad it was going to be we had no way to tell uh, whether this was going to be a bad mosquito season or or a West Nile season or another. Um, it, chicken gun is another great example. Dengue fever is another one. We don't know why uh, these have not perhaps flourished or spread as rapidly as what we've seen. Um, but uh, it, it's not that it's harder to transmit, maybe, or is it just because uh, more, more mosquitoes got well, infected? Is it even possible that 
a lot of people have had these yeah. and they passed and never even knew it. Yeah, so immunity is another good. So there's a lot of variables that you have to look at. Immunity is certainly one that you could put to the equation. Uh, we just don't know the overall ecology of mosquito transmission, you know, and we've had a lot of theories, you know, does it play into having a, a cooler winter or a wet spring or a hot dry summer and, and none of those have seemed to really work out 100% as being So even when we don't have as many mosquitoes out there sometimes You know, I, I think that we definitely know that the more mosquitoes that are out there, the more likelihood they are going to transmit disease and more, more like but there's there's really some, some different patterns like this year for example, we had a bunch of mosquitoes this year uh, and I know we had quite a few West Nile cases but really not as bad as 2012 mm -hmm. um, and so I, we can't say why um, even with the mosquito abundance that we saw in Dallas why we didn't see more West Nile like we saw in 2012. Well the mosquitoes if you have tons of mosquitoes and none of the, them are infected then you yeah, have passing virus. Be, maybe the education is working. Maybe the people are using more D. Uh, you know, I, I would I would like to think so. Uh, the removal of breeding grounds, you know, standing water, doing the education about wearing repellent, staying out away from outside, you know, particularly in the highest times of the days where period of the daytime, at evening, early evening, early morning where there's more mosquitoes. Yes, I mean, it certainly, the message got out in 2012. We knew it was quite dangerous to be outside during that time um you know maybe some of those things are are working to in our favor to prevent disease uh, transmission aside from the obviously birth defects that um caused by zika does zika act different in men than it does women well so we don't know for sure um it, it, you know the other question that comes up a lot is there any any danger as an adult to having a zika infection most of most of we talked about as being a mild illness with a fever rash sore muscles that kind of goes away after about a week. Uh, there have been some reports of severe infections or, or in, and neurological problems uh, in adults that have gotten Zika infections. So it's not, it's thankfully very, very rare. Uh, but I think we have to be very cautious in saying that there's nothing risky about getting a Zika infection if you're an adult and don't intend to have children. I, I, I don't think that that's a safe assumption. So people who've had more severe cases, are there Comorbidity uh, indications Nothing there, has, or not, you no. know, for they they have not. Now there was a good study, by the way, with HIV and Zika. They didn't find any increased, um, you know, infection uh, severity. Uh, so we don't say for sure, how, you know, whether we know what would cause a more severe infection hmm. risk. Hmm. Um, so and wearing DEET uh, that will prevent the mosquitoes. So that will help you with just those mosquito-borne illnesses, just like you still need to wear a condom because spreading HIV. Uh, if you can still get a couple of these disease res or um, it, um, drug resistant, drug resistant yep. thank you, yep. drug resistant uh, forms of it. Uh, but y without wearing a condom, you can get gonorrhea, syphilis, and all those other things. Wearing DEET is not going to prevent gonorrhea. No. No, okay, I, so I was wondering where you were going with that. That's where I was so going you, you were, uh, so you're, that you're, you're, I was wondering, too, you, you in, the the same way, the dots. in the same way <laughs> that you're saying, you know, DEET will help prevent this right. one, you know, maybe two or three diseases. Right. Wearing a condom is going to prevent those other things right. as well as... That's right. Protection uh, you know, I think it does build protection. to the story that where we where we are today, um, these these health risks, these threats, these infectious disease threats are around us. We cannot uh, deny them. We cannot, you know, uh, be be in denial that they are in, in and around us. And we do have good mechanisms and ways to be preventive. And you know, insect repellent prevents you from getting bitten by mosquitoes, which prevent West Nile, uh, encephalitis, Zika, chikungunya. Dingy, you know, all the list of those. And, um, and it also prevents other people from wanting to come near you, so it might actually well, prevent I mean, HIV. <laughs> <laughs> there are other, not, more than the D, there's plenty to go through, so you can find your own scent or find your own, no. um, that's your own, where you're I, but I, 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 Mosquitoes seem to love me, and we do have a pond in our backyard. Yeah. Um, we try and control it as best we can, but I douse myself with D, and it does yeah. seem to work. But yeah. if I don't have it on, they are on me like white on rice. Yeah.
Yeah, it, it's uh, and and definitely there's there are people that have uh, you know more experiences or, or more frequently bitten uh, or more severe reactions when they are bitten. So it's definitely definitely true. Um, you know, unfortunately, ponds do present mm-hmm. opportunities. You could, there's some things you can do. You can get those dunks to prevent the larvas the larvas yes. from growing mm-hmm. and things like that. So so there are some solutions out there, thankfully, to uh, enjoy a pond yet at the same time prevent mosquitoes from breeding. Hmm. Um. Any, we're coming to the end of the uh, hour. Uh, any uh, warnings for people, or some advice for people, or things that they should look for uh, with any of these lovely diseases that we've been? Talking you know, about? where do you start on that? The, you know, I, a couple of things that I would I would offer um, as, we, as we've talked about this wide range of different infectious disease threats. I'm glad we did this, by the way, because it's not just about HIV today, mm-hmm. and and you know. Part of our experience with HIV is a tremendous amount of stigma, um, and HIV is just like any other infectious disease. And so, um, the good thing is we're talking about these as all different, you know, things, and it's not just one s- specific thing. Of course, the concern is now we have a lot of different threats to contend with. Um, the, the the thing that that I think is is important is. The ironic part is while we still we, we have this great treatment for HIV in particular, we have PrEP now, you know, all of these tools, and we're still seeing new infections, and we're still seeing them in people that come in with no T cells or low C4 count. And that means that they've been living with HIV here in this community for years. And so despite all of that we've talked about with LifeWalk and all of the in, in, initial work, work that we do, you know, all of the, the awareness that we do, for some reason we're still missing the point, which is getting a test. And whether it's our denial, you know, our mechanism of denial or lack of awareness, it's still a part of what we're seeing every day. So the last thing I would say at the end is let's all make sure we're getting our HIV test. Yes. Um, and, and what about a test for any of the other STDs? Absolutely. Why? you're getting that HIV test, go ahead and get that syphilis, chlamydia, gonorrhea test as well. Because most of those do not have any warning signs uh, un- until the disease kicks in. Yeah, absolutely not. Uh, many, and particularly chlamydia, uh, about 80% of the time, asymptomatic, meaning you have the infection, but you don't have any signs or symptoms, and you pass it to somebody else who will, that sort of thing. Wow. wow. John, always fun to have you. Always fun to have you, John. Because talking about discussing diseases is just a, one of my fun things to do. <laughs> Glad to help. Yeah. Uh, we'll be back next week. We think we have some real good guests next week. I think so. And we won't know until we get a couple of confirmations Check on that. Check out our but Facebook page. We'll announce it on there. Yeah, we'll see you next week. This is William, hopefully your favorite videographer from Two Hats Publishing. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like it, please leave comments below or like, follow, or subscribe to us and get notices of all our videos. We love it. Even when you call.